Is that Kevin? Oh. Oh, we're going to. Kevin Smith. Good morning. Good morning, Kevin Smith. Kevin. How are you? How are you guys? Hey, were they playing uh, Clerks in Central Park yesterday? That's uh, that's why I'm calling in. It's happening on Sunday. Oh, Sunday. Sunday. Because I, uh, I do a lot of biking, and I uh, bike. Oh, wait, I'm bad. My bad. It's Saturday night. Oh, Sunday. man. Because I was two biking. Things, two things I... that I'm going to tell you about. What about the bike? Go ahead. Oh, no. Just, I, I was just biking around, and I saw where they're going to have uh, the, the, the festival. That's yeah, cool. They're really doing a quick, quick little mini movie festival in Central Park. And I knew really Kevin Smith neat. had yeah. uh, cl- Every summer they do this uh, festival in the park, and then they do this voting online to let you pick the last movie. And this movie, this year they, it was Clerks were coming to America. And so <laughs> folks voted up Clerks, and but then Clerks gets to play. It's a Saturday uh, night in Central Park. I think it's in the Sheep's. It's called Sheep's Meadow. Yeah. Um, and and Brian O'Halloran will play Dante. He's going to get up, introduce it, and do Q&A and stuff. Oh. Unfortunately, I'm going to be in Ottawa on stage, so I, I won't be there. Oh, you won't be able to make it? Cool. It's no, close to Sheep Meadow. It's a bummer, man. Like, can you imagine? Uh, it's coming up or on the 20th Meadow. year. Yeah. It's coming up on the 20th anniversary. And yeah. 20 years ago when we made that flick, no, we, never in a million years did we manage it would, did we imagine it would be uh, exhibited at all, let alone in Central Park. Yeah. Later. So that's a very cool thing for us. That is pretty goddamn cool. Man, anybody but, else uh, from the movie uh, going to be there? Uh, all, I know for a fact Brian's going. Okay. Uh, Jason Mewes is going to be uh, with me. So, I, Or maybe actually he's flying down to Jersey, too, so he might go there. We have a pretty busy weekend. Right now I'm in Florida. I just went to Star Wars Celebration 6, which was amazing. What was and that all about? They do a convention every other year, the Lucasfilm or Star Wars organization, and essentially they throw their own Comic Con, but just for Jesus. Star Wars fans. So it's called Star Wars uh, <laughs> Celebration. This is the sixth time uh, they've done it, I guess, here in the States. I think they've done it twice abroad. So it is like a gathering 25, 30, 50,000 Star Wars fans. Over Holy three, shit. Three days <laughs> in Orlando. Yeah, it's pretty damn neat, and I got up to. Q and A last night, or, you know, the normal Q and A show, but it was very Star Wars centric, so that was a lot of fun. What what kind of cool yeah. shit was there? Yeah. Oh, they've got stuff on display on the floor. There's people walking around cosplay. I mean, if you're remotely a Star Wars fan, bring a wallet because boy, they got uh, stuff that you've never seen before. Really? You know Vendors coming from all over the country and stuff. So it's uh, it's neat, man. It's it's an eyeful, uh, and and the people are just so sweet. Dude. You know, you talk about a bunch of Star Wars fans. Yeah, a bunch of Star Wars geeks. You know, they're, they're pretty pretty harmless. You could come down here and dominate. You could literally come down here and and take over the con. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, man. Nice, but they're soft. I want to um, go to that really yeah, bad. That does sound how, so, like something might be pretty fun. Never. It was. It, it's a good it's time, man. Like I, I went up, went up on stage last night to do the Q and A. I got a little emotional because I was talking about the kid I used to play Star Wars with when I was a kid. His name was Pete King. He would come down from Brooklyn to New Jersey every summer. His family had a, a bungalow, so I, you know, his dad worked for I think it was the Power and Light Company in the city. And when it came to the summertime, he just wanted to get out of there, bring his family down to Highlands because you know there's a beach there and a seaside community. So Pete King I had every Star Wars figure there was and the yeah. big toys and play sets. So he'd come down every summer and we'd sit there and play Star Wars. And I was telling the cats last night that, like, uh, when he was about 19, 20, uh, you know, he stopped coming down. We stopped playing Star Wars around the age of 13. He got more into punk rock and stuff like that. And one day he was out with his friend, stepped off a curb in Manhattan and just got slammed by a taxi cab. And, oh, man. You know, it was Jesus. really sad. So uh, I went uh, on stage. Like, happy uh, story. Like, it's not very happy Gee. to begin the Star Wars celebration with, but oh, I man. told him that, and, and, and then, you know, so it's kind of like me and Pete finally made it. So it was a really, really nice moment. And then, of course, lots of uh, Mon Mothma jokes and stuff like that. Of very course. Humor. Every, every Star Wars joke I, I always thought was too obscure to include in a movie I was able to bring out last night. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll did, get them. <laughs> Kevin, did you go to a... Did you, did you go to a Star Wars, uh, uh, the the orchestra thing live when they did that? No, no, but I it, heard it was fantastic where they performed the score live uh, it, with the movie. It was amazing. Well, first of all, in the lobby of the venue, they had all, like, actual memorabilia from the movie. So, like, I took pictures of the actual Han Solo frozen in carbonite, like the actual oh thing. Oh, really? Shit like that. Awesome. And then you go in, there's an orchestra, there's a full, there's the biggest L... CD screen ever of all time or whatever uh, behind the stage and they play the they there's a live symphony and chorus there and they play to the clips but 
they play it perfectly timed oh, live wow. to the footage That's of the cool. That's and awesome. they and then Anthony Daniels C3PO narrates the whole thing and he tells the story of all six Star Wars movies over the music and they start with the fucking 20th century Fox thing and oh. <laughs> long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And like, <laughs> dude, I'm getting chills talking about it. I literally cried through the first like five minutes of it. <laughs> through your tears. Out of excitement. I, you just were weeping openly <laughs> from the, weeping? the music. I get so excited at shit like that. It makes me cry. Music does I cried at a uh, fucking uh, b the last Wicked? Batman movie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the scene in ba Dark Knight Rises when the lights go out in that garage and that cop goes, oh, you're in for a show tonight, kid. And you're like, Batman's coming back. He's coming oh, back. Like, I, I, I cried from that. Rosa. Good for you, Joe. That, the moment, that wasn't the moment for me. The moment I, I, I started crying in Dark Knight was when he was flying away. Spoilers. He's flying away with yeah. the, the nuclear weapon. And he, it's him and his in the in the bat by himself, and they're playing that like you know high pitched kid singing like oh uh, yeah that oh. as he's sailing out, and I was like I, you know they cut to a shot of him flying, and I got I got sad because I was like man oh man like they'll never cut this guy a break now he's going to be killed by a nuclear weapon <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As we've all seen the movie, you know, there's a bit of a different ending. Yeah, but why yes. Why can't they just have him dead? Because it's Batman. But it's come Batman. on. Like, part of the trick of Batman is, like, he's almost invulnerable. He's a human. Yeah. This is the, 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 the double-sided coin of Batman. Everyone who likes him likes him because they see themselves in Batman. Like, he's got no superpowers. He's yeah. not from another planet. He's not supernatural. He's not a mutant. Here's a dude who just trained really hard, and he's got access to untold wealth. So because of that, he's a normal person who can become a superhero. So that's why people identify with Batman. But the odd thing is you want Batman to be as invulnerable as Superman. Like he's um, unerringly correct, always in the right place at the right time, has the right thing to say, knows where to put his fist, where a dude is about to punch, you attack him from nowhere, his <laughs> fist comes up, takes him out. Everything about Batman has to be so incredibly calculated where even if he's facing down the smartest person in the world, he's like, uh, I, I've already beat you 10 minutes ago. And then he explains explains how or something so when you see if you're watching that movie and you're like you can't kill batman batman can never die yeah he actually gave fans the batman ending that every batman fan needs which is like oh batman would never die like he found a way out of that plane he yeah a nuclear but that's radiation. why it would have been cool no you can't no. kill Batman. yes that's why it would have no. been cool so, do you realize well, people will accept batman People will accept jesus getting killed at the end of a movie before they'll accept <laughs> batman getting killed. <laughs> yeah. Batman has to be more powerful than Jesus. You know? <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. Um, so wait a second. So Saturday, uh, there's that Central Park screening at Clerks, totally free. Anyone yeah. can go up to it and stuff. Sunday, I'm going to give you a chance to come be on TV. You know, we do that show Comic Book Men on AMC. Yep. Yeah. That's, com that's coming back. I just saw the first episode of the new season. It was fantastic. I, they cut it together. It'll be on in October. One of the On Sunday, we're doing a signing for that book I wrote, Tough Shit down at the secret stash in red bank but we're shooting the whole thing for comic book men so everybody online people coming up to the table man it, here's an opportunity for you to be on the actual show with us from two to five on sunday come down to red bank uh for the signing and be on comic book men with us yeah and just going down to the shop is pretty goddamn cool you got some great stuff down there it is, yeah. you know, if you're into that stuff, you're remotely into the movies you made, there's props hanging up and whatnot, but uh, if you're one of those people who's like, I should be on TV, if Fat Kemp Smith's on TV and he's untalented, I too should be on television, <laughs> here is your absolute chance to do it. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Sunday from 2 to 5. Going back to something we were talking about before, man, the mm -hmm. Star Wars thing yeah. uh, with the live uh, orchestra, Yeah, I saw uh, Bugs Bunny on Broadway at the Garden State Arts Center in 19, well, let me see, it was 1993. <laughs> And it was um, basically the same thing. They took all these clips from classic Warner Brothers cartoons, like, you know, uh, Kill the Rabbit and all the very musical mm -hmm. episodes, and they had the live orchestra uh, performing it. it. It was pretty, it's pretty damned impressive, man. When, when, I got an, go ahead. Yeah, when, when you watch those old cartoons and realize that, I mean, there was an orchestra going over every little tiptoe move that the characters made, all of those, uh, you know, when they're running, uh, all of them had... A, a song behind it, and it wasn't just some stock music that they threw. Uh, it really is amazing the work that went into a fucking cartoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like when we watched those cartoons as kids, we thought clearly these were made for us to entertain us on uh, syndication on a on an after school or Saturday. <laughs> yeah, but those were theatrical shorts meant for 
uh, an audience that wasn't just primarily children. Most right. of those shorts were viewed by adults, so they poured everything into them. You're talking about gorgeous 24-frame animation, yep. not the limited animation stuff we were used to from Hanna-Barbera and other companies. Oh, when, when it just got shitty, right. Oh, the animation got crap. Background over and over yeah. again. Or even now, you know, in the age of flash animation, like all of us can be animators. But yep. watching those Warner Brothers cartoons where they were doing feature animation at 24 frames a second. I yep. mean, every second of film contains 24 separate images to make up that second. It's, it's lustrous. It, it looks almost real, even though it's a cartoon. And then on top of it... They built those amazing scores. They got full orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, what was, uh, I got their name. The guy's name escapes me. It begins with an L. And composed all of that music and poured it on top of it. And then included jokes that were aimed squarely at the older audience yeah. sitting there watching it. So <laughs> as we grew up, we're watching the Warner Brothers cartoons and being educated as well as being entertained. Unfortunately, we also grew up as a generation that's like, if you've got a problem with somebody, drop an anvil on there. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, it's like that era of Tom and Jerry, that where like yes. the Nelson Riddle years or whatever. Yes. Like, you know, like those are defined as the good Tom and Jerry years, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right. Then they got bad. Yeah, they got well, animation got cheap. Year. And there was one era, actually, that, that people figure the best Tom and Jerry, ironically, because most people will always be like, Hanna-Barbera and their limited animation. But Hanna-Barbera did the original uh, Tom and Jerry theatrical cartoons, the ones that everyone loves, you know, not the ones later on where they're friends, sometimes they're talking, uh, sometimes it looks very limited in the animation, but the ones that mm. were made back in the 50s and, and 60s were made by uh, Hanna-Barbera before they started their TV animation <laughs> division. And that's when they figured out, like, well, we could save money doing limited animations instead of 24 frames a second. We'll do, like, 12 or 15. <laughs> yeah, frames. yeah. So, but those cats who brought us, you know, a, a wealth of wonderful characters um, and all the hanna Bark Bear cartoons and stuff started by doing something even better looking, and that was those original Tom and Jerry cartoons that we all did. Even as a kid, I realized, like, the sucky animation when it was just the, the background, the character, and all that moved was the mouth when they had to talk. Like that, right. that, and, and it was just open and closed. It was a well, that, horrible thing, and even as a kid, I was like, eh, this isn't as good as like watching The Roadrunner. Or, well, that's uh, not true. Right. I, oh, I, I thought the Flintstones house was that long. <laughs> yeah, the Flintstones. <laughs> well, the Flintstones were fun <laughs> stories. Holy fuck, he could run. But the animation <laughs> was, was limited. That was prime time animation. The Flintstones yep. was a show like The Simpsons. Right. Yeah, the yeah. At nighttime. Remember how long that fucking house was? Yeah. The Flintstones yeah, house? Yeah. yeah, it was a long house. But then you see it from the outside, it was a short house. Yeah, they didn't give a fuck. <laughs> they didn't care. They didn't fucking cocksuckers. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's why it was so cool when uh, when Disney started to bring back the animated. Cause, uh, not that I don't mm. appreciate computer animated stuff, but it's just not quite as cool as the never will be. as the hand drawn hand It'll painted never stuff. be it's, as it's fucking absolutely cool. cool. No, I'm not saying it's not cool. I'm just saying it's not quite as astounding to me to right. look at and go, Jesus Christ, this is hand painted as as Kevin said, twenty four fucking frames per second. On an I mean, artistic that is, level. That is insane. And I know C G takes forever or C or computer animation, excuse me, takes forever to do. But uh there's something about the that you know it's so fun I was in here one time with that guy Chuck was in here promoting that movie Tangled, mm -hmm. and we yeah, started yeah. talking about this. And I go, you know, I go, I go, listen, man, oh. I go, it's really cool that you're in this Disney movie, but you know, I really miss those those hand painted drawn ones. And he goes, no, no, this is one of those. Uh, <laughs> I'm like such a fucking idiot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come along yeah. with that shit. It's kind of cool. Yeah. What's that? The, I, I watch a lot of animated uh, films because I got a young kid. Which so is amazing. One of my favorites that, uh, that you know, they've kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say stopped 2D animation, but yes, it's predominantly the CG stuff right now. But one of Disney's last 2D animation, I think The Princess and the Frog was the last one they did. But mm. prior to that, maybe two back was, I thought, one of their best, uh, Lilo and Stitch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with the 2D little, animation, it, it <laughs> clearly could have been CG because it takes place in space and lends itself to mm -hmm. characters and whatnot and renditions in, in the CG world. But... Their 2D animation of that was so wonderful and so beautiful, it popped it to life almost like it is mm. a Pixar film. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I remember going to see that one, and I don't even have a child. <laughs> I don't know why. So who's that creepy dude over there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, just, it's just me. Yeah. Well, you find yourself in the middle of a, 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 a Catch a Predator episode. Like, yeah. This, this gentleman wants to see Lilo and, Lilo and Stitch. Lilo Anthony, himself. why don't you just take a seat, leave the popcorn right over there? Yeah, we've got a plate of cookies over here for yeah. you, Ant. Ooh. <laughs> You brought Zima and condoms. <laughs> hey, Kevin, were you happy with Batman overall? Which one? Batman? Yeah, the, yeah, the did, last uh, one. Uh, you know, I'm a big Batman fan, so I did uh, two podcasts. I started on, we do a podcast now called Batman on Batman, where that's all I talk about is various uh, aspects of Batman. I've, I've had a lot of people from the cartoon on uh, recently. But uh, I started there with a review, and then we continued the review over on the next episode of Smodcast. It was a three-hour podcast. I'm not even lying. I'm a little ashamed to say it. But the second episode is literally me telling my friend Scott Mosier the entire movie from end to end, and with almost insane stoner-like detail. Having seen it only three times at that point, I literally reiterate the entire movie to Scott. He still hasn't seen it. He's like, there's no point in seeing it. What you told me is so much better than anything I could ever How many seen. times have you seen it now? I saw it three on opening week, and I saw it Thursday night before the troubles happened in Colorado. Uh, I saw it the next day on Friday um, with my wife when we were doing the show Spoilers. And she wasn't even going to go, but she got real indignant about the Colorado thing. And she was like, fuck terrorism. We're going to the movies, even though she didn't want to go. I thought that was kind of brave. And then on the next day, I took my kid to go see it. So I saw it all three. I saw it the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday on opening weekend. Um, I liked it quite a bit. There's hmm. definitely some, some plot holes or some stuff that I was like, man, are they going to tell us one more time that the autopilot doesn't work? Uh, there's little <laughs> stuff like that. But, and the fact that Bane is an incredible badass who gets taken out by Catwoman and a gun at the end of the movie. Yeah. Batman never really gets to beat him. But other than that, I thought they did some nice closure. It was epic, dude. That movie was so massive. It just looked like it was a disaster movie, a comic book movie, a vigilante movie, uh, a war movie all at once. It was very ambitious. And mm. when all was said and done, the first time I watched it, that Thursday night, I didn't even have a seat. I was standing for two and a half hours in the back. Jesus Christ. And the Never once felt it. Never once was I like, oh, so I need a chair. I was so enthralled. By Why wouldn't they give you a seat? You're Kevin uh, Smith. You know, they had sold out that screening, and I went up real late. And so we know the folks up at the at the theater at Universal City Walk because we've been shooting uh, spoilers up there. So I said, hey, man, can me and Muse come watch it? We'll pay, but we we got no seats. He's like, yeah, you can come up and watch it in the projection booth. So first we went up, we were watching it from the projection booth, but it's really loud. The projector, the IMAX projector particularly, is insanely loud. So we're sitting right next to it, <laughs> tougher to hear the, the, the soundtrack. So we just went downstairs and stood in the back of the theater, man. And, you know, I'm like, I'm 42, so I'm standing up. i got varicose veins running down my legs. I'm starting to collapse. <laughs> you know, feel, I'm, I'm feeling, feeling the vapors, if you will. Yeah. And then uh, it didn't matter, though. The story had me in, in, its, in its grip so tightly that uh, I didn't care, man. I, I was just way into it. Enough to go back the next day. I love Bane. All I do now is just Bane lines around the house. Yeah. I'm, like, well, I'm sitting here wondering why you shoot the man. out to the plane. Oh, my wife was just like, I didn't like it in the movie. Please don't do it while we're fucking. I, I didn't. Uh, I, I had a tough time uh, understanding Bane. Yeah, some people I say understand. that. Yes, I you really know, did. There were definitely a few lines where it took me the second or third time to pick them up. Very few, though. I was really dialed in. But I Kevin, as a as a filmmaker, why would you allow that to to go through, knowing that some people will have a tough time with some of the dialogue of that character? To be fair, when they put the trailer out for the movie, the six-minute opening sequence that they put at the top of, uh, I think it was Mission Impossible, uh, when it was out, they right. put out, and Warner Bros. released the six minutes of yes. pain on the plane and blah, blah, blah. Yes. When they did that, immediately, I guess it was like over 50% of the respondents were like, I can't understand what Bane's saying. I wasn't one of them. I love the fact that I couldn't understand. It made me work harder to listen to them. Like, <laughs> in the movie business, we're so used to spoon-feeding everybody the easiest access possible to the story and the details. And that's why there's so much exposition where somebody's just like, yeah, we have to get that bomb out of here or it might destroy this whole island and stuff like that. Yeah. So, for, for me, I, I like being challenged. I like where they make me work a little bit harder. So when I first heard the voice and it made me try harder to listen and to focus, zero in on it, focus in on it, I thought that was great. Then I started reading stories about how 
so many people complain that they went through and redid all Bane's dialogue. And there are clips on YouTube. There's this one great clip where they take, I think it's about 10 lines from the movie, um, from that opening sequence, and then put them up against the 10 lines, same 10 lines in the finished version of the movie. And they completely redid his voice. He completely re-recorded his performance as well. Really? And even given that, there were some people who were like, I still can't understand it. And I would have preferred if they kept it the way it was in, in the uh, the six minutes that they showed us before the movie came out. Go to YouTube, dude. Just mm. cl- click in Bane Voice. And there's this one clip that somebody did. It's, it's fantastic, where you get to hear all the lines as they originally were in the, re- the released six minutes from back in uh, Christmas. And then it's the same line from the current released version of the movie. And they did a lot of work on it. So if they didn't do any of that work, you would have been really frustrated. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Can I ask, I want to, because, Kevin, you're the guy to ask this question. You brought up the point that Bane got shot by Catwoman with the gun. And Batman never really beat him. And people have complained about that left and right in this in, in the movie. They go, oh, Bane deserved a better death. This, this, this. I thought that that was awesome because I felt like that brought the I brought that brought so much closure to to the to this particular Batman story, which was Batman. You can't beat this guy. He is stronger than you. He is more powerful. And then Catwoman comes in and shows Batman. Look, some people need to be fucking shot. And killed. <laughs> and, oh, that's great. And you're not going to go that far, so it's time to fucking step down. Time to wake up and get a, a few firearms. <laughs> that would have made that an Academy Award winning movie if, if there was just one brief two minute monologue. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that's classic, I Joe. I appreciate the fact that your parents were killed by a gun, but every once in a while. Every <laughs> once in a while, dude. <laughs> and now Catwoman has something on him. <laughs> yeah, you know, a little, little something. But yeah, did Bane yeah, die? Because they, you know, kind of made it look like maybe he's not dead. That was maybe that was he's still alive. Yeah, that was my only problem with it. Was when she shot him, I was like, wait, is he dead? And then they never went back yeah, to it. I was like, okay, back. I guess yeah. he is dead. I think the way they get away with a, a lot of heightened violence in the Nolan flicks is they don't actually show it to you. It's more suggested. If you think back to the Dark Knight. Whenever Heath Ledger is killing someone with a knife, you never see it. It's done with, like, a cutaway and a piercing uh, kind of a violin shriek or something like that. <laughs> so, like, you know, when he's brought to the gangster yeah. who's like, oh, well, I'll give a million for him, to, uh, uh, 500,000 for him dead, a million for him alive so I can teach him manners. He brings him in there and he puts the knife to the dead. The Joker pops up out of the bag, puts the knife to the dude's face, to his mouth, and starts telling him the story about, you know how I got these scars? And they tell the story, looks at the other guy, goes, why so serious? And then he quick does a movement to cut, and they cut to from behind, and the dude drops to the floor. Now, logically speaking, he had a knife in his mouth. If you cut some dude's mouth with a, uh, with a knife, he ain't going to die. He'll drop to the ground and start screaming and stuff. But in this movie, it's represented as him literally being dead. He drops him to the floor. And he's no longer a threat whatsoever. Uh-huh. Um, they did that a few times in the movie. Every time he starts... Using a knife, there's no blood in evidence, so you get away with it. Same thing with shooting Bane, man. Mm. They shoot him with two rockets, but there's no blood or anything, so it's a pretty horrible death. But at the same time, you're like, I'm sorry, did he die? Because I see no evidence of blood. Mm. Right, right. I don't even think they show his dead body. Like, he 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 gets thrown. I mean, I only saw it once, but he gets thrown back when he gets shot. Yeah, and then the room. Yeah, he's yeah. just like in a wall or something. Right? The, yeah. yeah, he hits the wall and he's bumped on the floor. Yeah, yeah. But that confused, what you just said about the knife thing, the knife scene in a, a, a Dark Knight when he kills Gamble, like, th- that confused me too. I remember seeing that in the theater and being like, what the fuck just happened? Did he just kill that guy? Or, like, like it was confusing. And, and if he killed him, did he kill him by cutting his cheek open? Like, that would hurt. <laughs> yeah, it would oh, hurt. That would suck. <laughs> Unattended for hours, you will definitely bleed out, but. In that moment, you wouldn't suddenly be like, I'm dead like a video game character, you know, just dropping to the floor. Right, yeah. And even if he moved it from the dude's mouth quickly down to his throat, I mean, I've never had my throat slit, but anytime <laughs> you see someone get their throat slit in a movie, it usually takes them a little bit to, to die. So you but can make gurgle. Thing, yeah, they gurgle a little. It goes down. Yeah, there's a little bit of gurgle. Death a little rattle. gurgle. Yeah. yeah, it's a good but point. Again, about the... like, I, we could sit here and pick a point. Minor stuff about Dark Knight that, yeah. that bummed me out, but overall, just such a, it was so big, dude. And they treated Batman 
with the exception of the first half hour where Batman's like, I won't be Batman anymore, which is something <laughs> he would never do. Um, they treated Batman with absolute respect, I thought, and, and yeah. kind of gave him a nice, a nice uh, closure, nice end. What, like what did you think yeah, about yeah. Batman? I mean, Batman's always been known for using gadgets and using you know his money to purchase and make and invent these gadgets to use on his on his arch nemesis. But I felt like all all Batman did with Bane was try to throw fists at him the whole movie, and I kind of thought that was a little lame. People. Yeah, can... they, well, he had gadgets, right? But the gadgets were kind of like... And know, another thing I thought that was kind of lame about it was that he tries to throw that, that magic drug powder in Bane's face. Like, you should know he's from the League of Shadows. It's not going to work, dude. Yeah, yeah but people... He's like, ah, the and deception. <laughs> 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 people, com people complain about the gadget thing, and to my, my whole response to that was they showed the gadgets in the first movie. They showed more of them in the second movie. The Nolan is clearly a filmmaker that was like, We've been there. We don't need to retrace this right sure. now. This is this is an emotional, personal story about Batman. But they're pitching Bane as this superhuman guy. Like he's got this apparatus strapped to his face that's pumping him with super juice. And then Batman shows up with a bum leg. And instead of doing anything, instead of using his cunning or gadgets, well, he just throws his meaty fists at Bane. The thing, <laughs> the thing I didn't get was they 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 showed you that that leg thing he gets put on where he kicks through like the right. cement thing. I'm like, why didn't he use that? That ever? to kick through Bane's fucking face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 There, there's definitely some issues with the Dark Knight Rises. There's some holes. The, the, leg, a little bit. the leg brace was something I had a hard time with, too, where I'm like, and, and it's weird because, you know, you got a movie about these people who are like, we have a clean energy device, which we've somehow turned into a bomb. <laughs> yeah. Well, how yeah, about the well, fact that uh, the, the entire Gotham police force is underground for like a month and nobody has <laughs> facial hair when they come out? <laughs> the movie... <laughs> Uh, that's a good one. The movie did walk some weird mixed line between the right and the left politically, where it was like, look, you lefties, your fucking clean air device is evil, see? <laughs> <laughs> and then there was the Wall Street commentary. I was like, I don't know which side Christopher Nolan is on right now. It was kind of like, it was like in the issues that debate amongst all you mere mortals, the only thing that matters is Batman. Yeah. I gotta yes. agree with him on that one. I, I liked the movie. I thought, uh, I loved the action. It was huge. Uh, to see it on the big IMAX screen was amazing. Let's not forget uh, about Anne Hathaway, too. She was. She looked great in that little cat fucking. Real, I thought she, she was, did a great job. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, she was oh, gorgeous, she too. They were saying she's not Michelle Pfeiffer, but I was like, well, Michelle Pfeiffer did great, but really think about that Catwoman in Batman Returns. Like, that's not even close. Not to even. Catwoman no. in the comics. Like, I, I Anne think Hathaway Anne Hathaway was better. Really yeah, 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 but so. she's not saying so much though. My one of my best <laughs> one of my best friends that I grew up with is Anne Hathaway's first cousin. And uh I he came out to a show the other night and I was talking to him and I and just in the middle of the conversation I go, Oh, by the way, your cousin was the best cat woman ever. <laughs> and he was like, I know, wasn't she great? She's really good. Like, but it's funny watching a guy talk about some naked li picks. literally saying like it's my cousin playing Catwoman. And I, but she was the best. The Michelle Pfeiffer was good. But the fucking origin of that, we talked yeah. about that last yeah, year, yeah, with the cats yeah. biting her fingers made her cat woman. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> All of a sudden, she's like, I, I've been licked by zombie cats. I am cat woman. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. That had nothing to do with, with the comics whatsoever. No. no. So, but, so for, by that alone, Anne Hathaway's cat woman, I thought, was a yeah. massive improvement in backstory, but just in terms of performance. Like, I'm not the world's biggest Anne Hathaway fan, but I thought she was really good in the flick. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. There are a lot of people on Twitter. I'm not, I kid you not. This movie came out one month and four days ago. I'm getting blown up on Twitter with people going, you jackasses are spoiling the movie. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm seeing it here, too. A lot of people are pissed off the, the movie's uh, spoilers. At, at like, least stop. a month old now, right? The oh, movie, it came out July 20th. It's now August 24th. Oh, yeah, that's, over that's a month. their fault, then. That's I'm plenty sorry, of time. Yeah, like, if, if you haven't been involved, it would be like, you can't talk about Avengers yet. Spoilers. Hey, man, it yeah. happened. Yeah, stop. Uh, Kevin, we uh, absolutely have to go, but do what do you got going on? Uh, give us uh, give us a one, one more time. On Saturday, if you're anywhere near Manhattan, uh, right near New York City, you come up, see Clerks projected on the big screen for free in Central Park. Brian O'Halloran going to be there. The guy who played Dante cool. doing Q&A. Yeah. The very next day, on Sunday, if you want to come be on our TV show, uh, Comic Book Men, 
Come down to Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash in Red Bank from 2 to 5. We're doing a signing. You don't have to buy anything. Uh, people come in, just have stuff tagged or whatever. Bring your books if you've already bought them, the tough shit books. And we're going to do a signing from 2 to 5 on Sunday and shoot that for the TV show. So not only can you get your craft signed, you might be on TV with the comic book men. Very cool, Kevin. Always a pleasure, sir. Yes, Always Kevin pleasure, Smith. Uh, thanks, man. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Great talking to you guys. Love talking Batman this early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cool, man. Right. Take it easy, Kevin. And, of course, that Kevin Smith on Twitter.